All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for our, our June Pepper Center Round. Um, I, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Lily Chan. Dr. Chan is an associate professor in the Barbara Murphy Division of Nephrology and Charles Bronfen Institute of Personalized Medicine. She completed her medical school training at Drexel University College of Medicine. She went on to complete her internship and res residency at Rutgers University Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and joined the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai as a clinician research fellow, where she is uh, currently faculty. She's a clinical investigator who has research focused on big data and patient-centered outcomes. She is a K-23 on identifying novel risk factors of adverse clinical outcomes in patients on hemodialysis using natural language processing. So welcome, Dr. Chan. We'll let you take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming today. And thank you so much for inviting me to give my talk. I will end a little bit, uh, a few slides with what I'm doing for the K-23, but this is work that's been before and kind of ongoing. Um, so the topic today is on identification of symptom burden in patients on hemodialysis and informatics approach. Uh, these are my disclosures and they are unrelated to the talk today. So the objectives are to provide just a brief overview of natural language processing, a review what current research is available in NLP and nephrology, discuss how we use NLP for identification of patient symptoms, and then ending with changes in symptoms with interdelic interval. So I always like to start uh, my presentation with this slide. These are actually two of our former nephrology fellows after clinic. And I asked everyone to just kind of think, how much time do we as physicians um, are spend on documentation in the electronic health records? And if you want to feel free to put in some comments in the chat, um, but I can give you a second just to do that. And I will tell you that based off of Medscape surveys, physicians overall spend about 16 hours. And then me as a nephrologist, are actually spending about 17 hours per week on paperwork and administration. So that's just a lot of time that um, we're spending doing these things. And then we actually, this is a nice figure that looks at, you know, what are all the sources of medical information that's out there? And it breaks it down into two different things, which is one structured data, and then on the other side, unstructured data. Um, and the structured data are the things that we can easily pull from the electronic health records. So ICD codes, different types of medications and vital signs. And then on the right side here are the uh, is unstructured data, meaning that these are the free text things, the, the agent, the progress notes that we write, the imaging impressions. And so all of this is where we're spending a significant amount of our time documenting, but it's often inaccessible to us because it's in free text and we don't have easy ways to uh, pull that information other than manual chart reveal. And that's where natural language processing or NLP comes in. So NLP is a branch of artificial intelligence focused on giving computers the ability to understand text and spoken words. And this kind of sounds abstract when I just say NLP, but it's really everywhere. So NLP and machine learning is being used in different Google searches. So just here, as we start typing natural language, um, Google will automatically know what we're, or suggest what it is that we're trying to look for. Or here on the right, where I spell my institution wrong, Mount Sinai, they essentially give me the correct searches that I want anyway, which is Mount Sinai Hospital. Another even more simplistic thing is when we're doing a spell check uh, using our word processor and it recognizes that this is the wrong spelling of the word and gives us the actual correct spelling. And if you've been following the news in tech or really uh, almost everywhere, um, ChatGPT has kind of exploded. And this is a type of large language model is actually generative AI, but it is inherently a type of NLP. So how has nephrology research been using NLP so far? I'm gonna come go through a couple of examples. Um, in this one study out of Columbia University here in Manhattan, they, you, they you built an NLP algorithm to identify pa patients with chronic kidney disease. So first they started off by identifying terms that were associated with chronic kidney disease from the progress notes, uh, from progress notes of nephrology visits. And these were the different ways that they identified it being documented as. And then they kind of built this classifier um, to identify whether or not these terms were being used in the progress notes of patients seen at internal medicine clinics. And here are the results on the right side. So they had a group of patients who had known chronic kidney disease 
a group of patients who did not have chronic kidney disease, and they assessed whether or not the, the NLP algorithm was able to identify them correctly. And here on the bottom are the test parameters. And you can see that the performance of this NLP algorithm is quite high. So what this is showing is that you can use NLP to identify potentially different um, disease processes. In another study, this was done by Singh et al. They looked at all of the progress notes of patients who were uh, seen by an adult nephrologist at Brigham and Women's from 2004 to 2014. And they extracted concepts from the notes uh, from one year prior to the first nephrology visits. And they also included some structured data. So the demographics such as age, gender, race, ethnicity, billing codes, and some laboratory values. And this final cohort was 4,000 patients. And what's interesting to find is they grouped them into top 10 positive predictors, meaning these were associated with an increased risk of end-stage kidney disease. And what I kind of wanted to highlight was things like fast food and liver tumor, uh, or they were ultrasound, were indicated or were associated with a higher risk. And maybe some of the liver stuff would have found if we looked through structured test, to text structured data, but that's certainly not fast food documentation um, would not have been there. And if we look at the top 10 negative predictors, some things you can imagine would be um, patients who are more frail would be not associated, uh, actually that you would think is opposite, but liver transplant um, diagnosis is actually associated with a less risk of end-stage kidney disease, and that's because potentially people who had had a renal syndrome, had a liver transplant, actually would not have progressed to their end-stage kidney disease. And then in a more recent study done in 2021, and this was a study out of uh, Europe, and they built several different machine learning models. And here are the results. And really what I wanted to highlight is that they used four different types of machine learning models. And they had one that was all features, and this is the performance, um, which is actually quite good across all four with an accuracy of 0 0.84 and 0 0.91. And then when you compare that to uh, the performance without using any of the text, which is without using the NLP algorithm from the progress notes um, to identify features from the free text, performance was actually worse when those, that information was not included. So, we're going to move on now to how we can use NLP to identify patient symptoms. And so this is data from the United States Renal Data System, um, which is kind of the American database for all patients who are on any type of dialysis. And what I did want to show is that, you know, from 2001 to 2015, overall mortality actually has been declining, which is a great thing. But now that people are living longer, we are focusing more on patient outcomes because we don't want them just to survive longer. We also want them to have better quality of life. So this was an initiative um, that was international. It's called the Song HD Initiative. And what they did is they actually uh, did, conducted a conference where they invited patients, caregivers, and providers to ask them what are important outcomes that we as researchers should be focusing on. And they're then grouped it into three different tiers of outcomes and importance. The outer tier, which is some importance to some uh, stakeholders. The second is very important to some stakeholders. And then the core outcomes being critically important to all of the stakeholders. And what I wanted to highlight here in uh, underlined is that a lot of symptoms actually made it into the top tiers of patient outcomes that patients, providers, and caregivers actually cared about. So it's not just that they cared about you know, living longer or um, their vascular access, but they also cared about things like how tired they were, how much pain they were feeling, having cramps during dialysis. You might then ask, well, okay, they care about it, but how many people, how many patients is this really affecting? So this was a survey done uh, back in 2009, and they looked at patients who were on end-stage kidney disease and also on chronic kidney disease. And I just wanted to highlight a few of the symptoms, um, things like fatigue, which was one of the top outcomes that patients cared about, affects seven, nearly 80% of patients both with, on dialysis and with chronic kidney disease not yet on dialysis. Dry skin um, was also about half of the patients. Itching was nearly half of patients and muscle cramping 40 to 50% of patients. 
And this is a more recent study just published uh, last year. And that, again, just showing that in patients who are on hemodialysis, um, symptoms were extremely common with 70%, again, reporting fatigue, 60% reporting some form of dry skin, and 44% uh, reporting some difficulty falling asleep. So I hope I've at least convinced you that you know, patients find that symptoms are important. They are affecting a majority of patients depending on the symptom. And so how frequent do patients experience these symptoms? And so here was another study, uh, somewhat older, back from 2011, where they surveyed patients on these seven different symptoms and asked them like, how often were they having it. Zero meaning that the patients really never have that symptom. Um, and then 10 being that it's during every treatment. And so you can see there certainly is variability by person and also by symptom, but there are some patients who report having fatigue over half and almost at every uh, dialysis treat, nearly every dialysis treatment. And not only that, they also ask patients, when do those symptoms get better? When do they go away? And so here is a breakdown of within minutes, arriving at home, at bedtime. But there is a minority of patients who actually continue to have symptoms until the next time they're on dialysis. And not only are they important, um, this was another study where they actually looked at, well, simply not how, of the reasons why people stop their dialysis early, like how many of those are symptoms. You can see here that over the year, about 38% of dialysis treatments are ended early because of cramping, feeling bad, or pain at the non-dialysis access site. And we have many, many studies that have shown that early termination of dialysis can lead to in a, in a, inadequate dialysis and clearance, fluid overload, which then increases hospitalizations and mortality risk. So hopefully I've now convinced you that Patients care about this. It's happening all the time. It lasts a long time um, and it affects a lot of different patients. So how is it then that we can identify symptoms um, quickly because we know that symptoms are also over under-recognized and under-treated? So you may or may not know this, but dialysis patients get seen by a lot of providers and this leads to a lot of different progress notes. So at every, most patients come to a dialysis unit three times a week. So at every dialysis treatment, a nurse or a tech writes a note on documentation of you know, how they're looking, what's going on, if they have any symptoms or any reasons or complications that the dialysis uh, had to be stopped. At, at Mount Sinai, the physicians do see the patients at least once a week. At other facilities, it might be a PA or a nurse practitioner. There's a social worker and a nutrition and as who sees the patients every month. And so you can just imagine the amount of data that we're generating on these patients that we're not actually using. And so Mount Sinai has been in this partnership with Clinithink, and this is the company behind Clix NLP, which is the NLP software that um, we've done one of the studies on. And so as a brief overview of kind of how NLP works is that we have a whole bunch of electronic health records and there's different algorithms. Some are freely available, some are proprietary, but they all do very similar things, which is that they break down the different texts into a way that can be analyzed with um, statistical methods. And the different steps include just recognizing that there could be wrong spelling of the words, um, tokenization, part of speech tagging, limitization, and named entity recognition. And then from there, we can recognize whether or not that symptom exists. And I'm gonna go through some of these steps just to get a, give you a better idea of what this looks like. So this is some uh, text that I actually took for the SPACI algorithm. It's a free package available on Python, which is a coding language. And what tokenization and segmentation does is you take the raw text, which is a sentence up here, and now you're splitting those words into its individual tokens um, or its individual words. And you can split it in different ways. So in this case, you're splitting simply by white space, and then you can go more granular or more deeper. Uh, and then splitting on suffixes and splitting on exceptions. And so it depends on the level, but this is kind of going to break it down so that it can be further analyzed. Now that you've had the tokens broken down, you then want to perform part of speech analysis, which is that you have to recognize which are the verbs and the nouns and where which verbs are acting on what noun. That's it. 
that's then called dependency parsing is that the verb is then acting on uh, the, the piano uh, and not on Gus. Lemmatization is a process of reducing similar um, words down. So for example, playing, plays, or played would just simply be considered as play because the text, the, the tense of the word may not necessarily matter in this case. Same with car, cars, car, and different variations of that. And what it does do is that our NLP algorithms then go through all of the text once it's been broken down and matches it into these standardized medical language terminologies. And in our case, Clicks NLP works with the SNOMED clinical terminology. And it is one of the most widely used healthcare terminologies in the world. Um, this is somewhat outdated and even back in 2018 is over 340 active concepts. And the concepts include not simply the medical term, but also relationships and descriptions of that term. So an example of one cl SNOMED clinical term that we care about is cramping. And so we can query for the overarching concept cramp, which would then include all of the different variations of the cramp uh, of cramping. And this is called the parent term, while these lower ones are called the children terms. So we could also specifically say we are only interested in looking at cramping in the limb, and we can do that, or we can say we're interested in cramping anywhere and choose the parent term. So how does this actually practically work? So let's say this is a very common sentence we would see on a patient in dialysis is the UF or the ultra filtration was turned off due to patient cramping in the legs. So if we look specifically at cramping, this is the text that, uh, or the output that we would then receive. And so what I wanna highlight here is that it will give us specifically the symptom, which is cramping in the lower leg, and that it is found in the skeletal muscle of the lower leg. And it is specifically for the person of record. Now let's, and it also tells us whether it's present or absent. Now let's say we change that sentence and instead we're using, you're parsing the word, the sentence is ultra filtration turned off due to possible cramping in the daughter's legs. And so what would change here is that if it goes from a known present to a known possible and subject of record to daughter. And then when we have a whole bunch of notes and a whole bunch of symptoms, what it does return is now we have a matrix where we have a patient at each row and a number of different symptoms as each column, one indicating that the symptom was found in that patient's progress notes and a zero indicating that it was not. And so what we did th with, with this is that we tried to identify those seven symptoms from the electronic health records of two different cohorts, the Biome Biobank and the Mimic3 database. Um, on the one hand, we compared the Clicks NLP performance with ICD-9 and 10 codes. And ICD codes are billing codes, which it generally has poor performance for things like symptoms, which would not necessarily enhance our billing. And so what is the Biome Biobank? Um, it is a cohort out of Mount Sinai and which has enrolled over 60,000 patients at this point. And all patients have provided informed consent for us to access their electronic health record. They fill out a questionnaire um, on different ancestries, physical activities, and they also have a sample um, of plasma and DNA that is a bank. All of our data um, was linked to US RDS in 2017 so that we could accurately identify patients who were end stage kidney disease. We then validated our results of our NLP algorithm in the MIMIC3 uh, database. MIMIC3 database is from the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and it includes um, over a decade of information. It includes both billing information, um, laboratory data, and notes. All of MIMIC3 is de-identified and uh, freely accessible. This is the study flow diagram that we have. So from the Biome Biobank, we identified a thousand patients who were on chronic HD. And we did do a slightly separate validation cohort. So those were patients who joined Biome after 2017. 
And from MIMIC, we identified 519 patients who were on hemodialysis. And we focused specifically on hemodialysis because their, their symptoms tend to be higher than patients who are on peritoneal dialysis. And HD patients also, or patients on HD also tend to have more healthcare encounters than patients on peritoneal dialysis. Here is the patient characteristics of the BioMe development cohort, the MIMIC validation, um, which is the external validation, and the BioMe validation, which is the internal validation. And I really just wanted to highlight a few points that the age of patients were pretty similar, except that the validation, because they were inherently enrolled in BioMe at a later date, were younger. And compared to the Boston cohort, we had higher uh, proportion of African American patients and Hispanic patients. And also important to note is that BioMe actually is a longitudinal cohort, meaning that anybody who was um, since enrollment, all of their data is included, while MIMIC is solely an intensive or critical care database. So it only includes information for patients who were admitted to the ICU. So the number of discharge summaries and progress notes is much higher in BioMe compared to MIMIC. So what we did is once we ran our NLP through to identify the seven different symptoms we found, we actually conducted manual chart review of 50 charts for each of the seven different symptoms. We then went and compared, um, looked at, tried to identify all of the systemic errors that we did identify. Um, so for example, here I give you uh, two, two things that we did find that were, con that were false positives. So here is the patient was advised to call for any fever or for prolonged or severe pain. So we clearly this was meant for, uh, was documented in a lot of post-operative or discharge summaries, but not actually saying that the patient has any pain or something that was kind of unexpected and we hadn't thought about initially is that the ECG was sinus tachycardia in v with V4 and V5 depressions. And clearly this depression is an appropriate use of depressions, um, but not for the kind of psychiatric illness or uh, feelings of depression. So we did two rounds of that until we were satisfied with the results. Um, and this is actually the performance of um, how our NLP algorithm worked. And so here are the seven different symptoms. And here um, in the blue means that these were identified by NLP only. In the green was by ICD only. And in the red, it was by NLP and ICD. So if you want to look at how many patients were identified with fatigue by NLP, you've got about 85%. And then the proportion of patients who were identified by ICD, it's only about 40%. And what you can see is that the blue bar so far surpasses the green bar for all of the seven, seven different symptoms. And on the top here is just the NLP for the BioMe cohort. And on the bottom here, you have NLP in the MIMIC cohort. And while overall the number of symptoms documented or the proportion of patients with symptoms documented is far lower in the MIMIC cohort, um, you can see that the NLP far outperformed ICD also. And we expected less symptoms to be identified in MIMIC cohort simply because they had less progress notes and they were also a critical care database rather than a long-term longitudinal database. We then used the 50 chart reviews to, to uh, provide some test parameters. And what I really wanted to highlight is that both in BioMe and MIMIC, NLP, which is indicated by the blue squares here, had much higher sensitivity um, than ICD codes. And that also had much higher negative predictive value um, than ICD codes. And specificity and PPV were actually pretty comparable across the two. So in conclusion, number one I have is that NLP had better sensitivity and negative predictive value for patient symptoms than ICD codes. The NLP symptom burden was similar to manual chart review um, that, and that uh, NLP can potentially be used as a screening tool to identify different patient-centered outcomes. And so one major criticism that we did have about that first study um, when it was published is that we had only used manual chart review as our reference standard, but oftentimes it takes a lot to get a symptom into the electronic health record, right? The patients experience the pain, have to then, or, or symptom, then have to tell the physician about it. And then the physician actually has to document this into the electronic health record. So being maybe a manual chart review, of our symptoms may not be reflective of what patients are actually experiencing. 
And so we actually conducted this follow-up study at our own dialysis unit, um, where we looked at first, what is the prevalence and frequency of symptoms in our patients? Do changes change, uh, do symptoms change depending on which day of the week we're asking them? And how good are we as providers at recognizing patient symptoms? And so just as a reminder, if you're not familiar, um, dialysis patients only, patients on hemodialysis only get dialysis three times a week. So this could be either a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule. And if you think about it, they actually get this two days off as a weekend between Friday and Monday or between Saturday and Tuesday. And prior research has uh, recognized and uh, demonstrated that mortality and also hospitalizations tend to be higher after the two-day long break. So that's the long interdelic interval. HD1 indicates the Mondays or the Tuesdays, uh, depending on which schedule they are, and all-cause mortality and cardiac causes are significantly higher um, after the long break. And also here is admissions, so MIs and stroke, congestive heart failure, or or any CVD admission is also higher on the Monday or Tuesday after the long interdelic interval. And the thought is that, um, remember our kidneys luckily work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they don't get a break, but the patients um, don't get dialysis every single day. And so what happens is that over those two days off, they actually have fluid and electrolyte buildup um, that could predispose them to either having congestive heart failure, or arrhythmias, um, because there's then rapid shifting once they're actually started on their dialysis um, of those electrolytes. And so what we did is we conducted a survey in our patients who, um, this is, Mount Sinai has one freestanding dialysis unit. Um, this is located on 117th Street. We, anybody who was over the age of 18 and had been on dialysis for more than 30 days were eligible. They had to be able to complete the surveys with minimal help and be on dialysis three times a week. And this was the survey that we conducted. So we used uh, a survey that was designed after the dialysis symptom index, which first asked them um, whether or not the patient experienced one of these symptoms, and if yes, to rate them by how much it bothered them by. While the dialysis symptom is actually longer, we selected out only the symptoms that would potentially vary uh, from a dialysis session to a dialysis session. This is a schedule of how we actually um, surveyed our patients and providers. So HD1, again, is the Monday of the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday of the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And so nurses and patients were surveyed at the last during the last 15 minutes of every dialysis treatment. And the physicians were asked to complete the survey once during the, uh, the last week of the enrollment period. And we designed it this way because this would more closely mimic the full documentation um, that providers were, would be writing in. So here is a study flow chart. Um, we had uh, 209 patients at the time and 97 patients actually completed all of these surveys. Uh, part of the delay or dropout was that we actually started this study just around when COVID started. So we had a number of patients for a certain time, we were not allowed to enroll patients. And then even afterwards, many patients um, were on isolation or hospitalized. These are the patient demographics. So patients who did enroll in our study were on the younger side for patients who are on dialysis. I believe the median age is about 65 or 67. Um, we had a very diverse cohort. It was 52% uh, Black or African American and 38% Hispanic. And this is self-identified. As expected, our patients had multiple different comorbidities where hypertension um, is quite common and along with diabetes and heart disease. Here are some of the laboratory values and um, mainly focusing as hemoglobin can be a factor in why patients feel very fatigued, um, how quickly we're moving fluid can also impact cramping and some symptoms, um, blood pressure average also can also indicate some of the symptoms that or affect some of the symptoms that patients um, have. And so here is an additional breakdown where we're comparing the short interval, meaning these are labs, uh, or values that have occurred on the dialysis session after the short interval, which is the Wednesdays or the Fridays, um, or the Thursdays and Saturdays, or after the long interval. 
which is the Mondays and the Tuesdays. And what you can see is that um, there is a little bit more intradiuretic weight gain after the long interval, um, but that there's actually not more fluid getting removed during that time, even though the rate of fluid removal is actually a little bit higher. We did unfortunately uh, not adjust um, for whether or not patients had changes in their fluid removal goal during the dialysis session. So here, what you can see is um, first is the how common the symptoms were in patients. So here are all of the different symptoms that we had. And we considered if a patient reported a symptom at least once on any of the 12 surveys, then they were counted as a positive. And so this is quite similar to the top symptoms as experienced uh, as reported by some of the other symptom surveys and fatigue being the most common um, with over 60% of patients having it and cramping also over 50%. We then looked at what is the frequency of it, meaning we took the number of surveys where the patient reported the symptom divided by the total number of surveys, which is 12. And you can see that again, fatigue in some patients experienced reported having fatigue at every dialysis treatment. Um, some people had the dry skin and also itching at every dialysis treatment. Again, we did ask them to rank the severity of their symptoms. And what this is, is we took the average of the reported symptom when reported by the patient um, at any time across the average across the month. Um, what is important to note is at least the good thing is that most patients reported severity to be pretty low, um, but some patients did report it to be extremely bothersome. And so here is the main results of the study is um, in the light gray are the results for the percent of treatments um, with the symptom. And this is on the gray gray short, while in the darker gray is the long interval results. And so we just did, this is how we calculated it um, because there are eight sessions that are short and four sessions that are long, we simply took the number of surveys for that patient um, over the short session and the percent of the long surveys uh, divided by four. And what is important to note is that the gray bars are much longer, taller than all of the light gray bars, um, indicating that pretty much for all of the symptoms, patients did tend to experience them more frequently um, after the long interval. And we also did this by gender and um, you can see that symptoms overall were extremely common regardless of gender, although female patients did report slightly more than male. And what, But when you actually look at the breakdown of in long versus short interval, again, the results are the same, is that after the long interval, regardless of, your, of the patient's gender, they reported having more symptoms after the long interval. And this is our uh, negative binomial regression analysis, which is here on the unadjusted um, and even after adjustment for multiple patient and dialysis related factors. Um, after the long interval, there was a 37% increase um, in risk of having a symptom compared to the short interval. And the final part of our research was whether or not patients, uh, whether or not nurses and physicians are actually uh, recognizing these patient symptoms. So just as a reminder, um, here is the schedule of how we surveyed all of our providers and patients is that nurses were asked to complete the survey at every dialysis treatment and the physicians completed at one time during the study enrollment. And these are the results of that um, comparing those surveys here in the light blue are actually the results of the patient survey and in the pink are actually um, the results of the nursing survey and then in the darker blue is actually the results of the physician survey. And what I really found interesting is that it really depended on which symptom, um, how well it was recognized and who recognized it more often. And so in the kind of red boxes here, you can see that nurses actually recognize the hypotension quite frequently, actually reporting more than patient symptoms, um, probably because they're getting very closely monitored during their dialysis sessions. Cramping is also very well recognized um, by nurses and also shortness of breath. 
And here in the kind of blue boxes is actually where the physicians reported more of symptoms than the nurses did. And this is for dry skin, itching, and edema. And kind of my hypothesis is why these are different is if you think about the types of symptoms, cramping, internal hypotension, and shortness of breath are things that would occur during the dialysis treatment uh, that the nurse would likely have to intervene on, whether it be changing the ultrafiltration goal, um, giving them saline, or putting them on oxygen. However, symptoms like dry skin, itching, and edema, those are things that are longer term um, that the physician is going to recognize and discuss with them for medical management at home for different options. So I think we've kind of um, shown you, I think, that you know, patients and there is a drop off between patient reporting um, to doctors and doctors recognizing these symptoms. But how about the documentation? And so we then went and obtained the progress notes for one month prior, the month of the study enrollment, and then one month after. And we have identified, we focused on the top five symptoms to kind of give our algorithm the best chance um, to see whether or not we can actually identify these symptoms. We then drafted out um, from the different medical clinical term dictionaries, different possible ways for us to document these different symptoms with all of the different synonyms, uh, burned out, weariness, weakness, and we all grouped them um, accordingly. And then just a reminder, um, for this portion, we actually did use SPACI. So this is the kind of pipeline of what actually occurred um, that our NLP algorithm conducted. And these are the additional results. Again, just focusing on the top five different symptoms um, to give ourselves the best shot in fatigue here in the dark blue is the patient report. Um, in the red is the physician, the gray is the nurse, and then the yellow bar is the NLP algorithm for EHR for documentation. Um, each of these asterisks denotes whether or not this was statistically significantly different than patients. Um, and you can see that overall documentation was much lower um, than what is actually reported. And we actually calculated the inter-rater reliability of the patient survey uh, with patient surveys as comparator using either nurse, physician surveys, or the NLP. And you can see that overall these numbers are quite low particularly for the NLP portions, with almost no documentation of dry skin. We also looked at um, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value. You can see that overall um, pretty poor for any symptom, but there is some variability. So we're probably pretty good at muscle, decent at muscle soreness, not so great at dry skin um, or itching. But specificity was relatively high, meaning that if it is documented there, then the, the patient truly did generally have, have, did have that symptom. And so we're almost uh, finishing up on this portion um, of the research. And we've also talked about if using different NLP algorithms um, and trying to see if any of these symptoms that we have identified is associated with other clinical outcomes that we might be concerned about, such as mortality um, or hospitalizations. And I think ultimately the next step is we'd like to either return results of surveys or develop um, some intervention so that we can improve recognition of patient symptoms, whether it be um, operationalizing this into the actual EHR or some form of standardized method of documentation. Um, so I, I'm gonna end with just a brief discussion of some of our ongoing work and which is using a lot of the technologies that I've talked about um, so far using the NLP to actually look at social determinants of health. So social determinants of health are the things where we live, work and grow up that impact our overall health. Um, and they can loosely be classified into these five different categories, education, neighborhood, social and community context, health and healthcare access, and economic instability. And this is just a conceptual diagram that I generated. I'm looking at how the different ways that social determinants of health can actually impact hospitalizations, uh, particularly in patients who are on hemodialysis. So one way is just simple health status. You know, if you don't have um, enough money, that, or if you're in economically unstable, then you're going to have a more difficult time managing your comorbidities, um, being able to find medications or have and have higher hospitalizations. 
And dialysis specific things is if you don't have good insurance um, or you're not able to take time off, then you might have not a catheter for dialysis access instead of a fistula or a graft. And a lot of research has shown that patients with fistulas and graft overall do better because they have lower risk of infections and overall less interventions needed for their dialysis access. And so we're currently enrolling patients. We are about 150 patients at this point. Um, we are expanding to several different new dialysis units. And so um, this is an ongoing project, but we are trying to see whether or not social determinants of health can be predictors of hospitalizations. And we're uh, on top of just the SDOH measures, we're also going to be including more traditional measures um, such as their health status, their comorbidities, and their di different dialysis specific things like albumin, which has been strongly associated with patient outcomes. So this is just really very preliminary results from about 130 patients. And to just to look at how you know, how many patients actually report an unmet um, SDOH. And so this is broken down uh, by their race, ethnicity. And you can see that about 30% of patients do report some food insecurity. A quarter of our patients are reporting housing instability. Um, 10 to 20% have transportation problems. Um, there is a small portion who also report interpersonal safety. So this is quite a large number of patients who do have unmet social determinants of health. Um, our dialysis unit is located in East Harlem. So I think there, there is some, um, depends on where our patients are from and where the dialysis unit is located. But this, these are results, or at least to me, are very concerning. The screen that we are using the, is the AHC HRSN screening tool, which I think is about 20 questions um, and has all of these different social determinants of health. I've only recorded the core ones, um, which were the top five over here. And the question we have is whether or not any of these measures um, will be associated with increased hospitalizations in these patients. This is a kind of outline of how we're going to uh, be doing the NLP analysis is once we've actually completed all of the surveys in our patients, um, we'll then use the NLP algorithms to uh, see if we can identify some of these social determinants of health. And um, we will obviously have to do quite a number of manual chart review just to see uh, so that we can test uh, get obtain some test parameters and performance of our CLIFS algorithm. And ultimately we will then have our final NLP algorithm so that we can report um, these test parameters once we're satisfied, satisfied with the results. So it's kind of a whirlwind tour of the past few years of my research. And it, this is clearly still ongoing, um, but only made possible by all of the mentors and lab members um, who are pictured here and some of the, our funding for the project. So. With that, I will stop uh, my screen share and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. <laughs> I'm just going to uh, see if I see any raised hands and um, or uh, feel free to put a question in the chat if you're not able to do raise your hand or just ask a question. I don't see any questions, um, but I uh, really, really enjoyed hearing about this. Thank you so much for coming to our pepper round. Uh, I have a quick question, Sarah. I'm yeah. sorry, can you hear me? So, yeah. <laughs> and, and I greatly uh, apologize, uh, Dr. Chan. I had to step out briefly to um, get in, get through TSA. But um, <laughs> one of the things, uh, you know, in terms of talking about NLP and, and the symptom burden, actually unrecognized symptoms by providers or even patients um, that you're capturing. I, I'm, you know, there's a lot of interest and I'm curious if you're going down this route in terms of the FDA, in terms of kind of in the, the post-market surveillance space for, for, for treatments to understand, you know, how people, how patients are experiencing these medications and what you're kind of capturing with your data is that it's a, it's, that it may not be captured very well at all. Um, but some of this real world data that you're getting, have you thought about that as an application? I think that it would have worked better if they, we had found 
been better at identifying those symptoms with NLP. And I think because it's not there, um, I can't see it being implemented in the current way. Um, yeah. Some things, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, there, there's actually, the FDA is, there's a lot of interest in understanding the goodness of fit of this yeah. data. Like, you know, is it actually going to be something that could be used to better understand it? Or it sounds like maybe you need to, there needs to be some work on the back end of how the data is collected before you can rely on it. Yeah, I think that's the problem with EHR data. They, it's very focused. I mean, rightly so, it was built for billing purposes and for communications across providers um, and not necessarily for these patient-centered outcomes. So there has been a big push, at least from the Medicare standpoint, to you know build out some symptoms and quality of life measures. So dialysis patients actually, um, we are now mandated to conduct yearly quality of life surveys. And that gets, you know, we give them a quality of life survey they gave it back to us and it gets filed away, never to see the light of day again. And so it'd be nice if that could actually be integrated into some of our workflows. And so I think there's a lot that needs to be done to increase, like we clearly are at least recognizing it, it's just not making it into the documentation. So a lot of work needs to be done to kind of rectify that before any applications of what we talked about. Um, I'm seeing some question about how I think ML can impact kidney donor or recipient eval process. So this is actually a, a huge field of research. Um, I think there's a couple ways. One is there, they've, it's, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not a transplant expert and I'll try to recall some of the studies that I have found on it. Um, they are, I think one, one area is to reduce the number of discards and so they're trying to build out some algorithms to better recognize patients who might have been discarded for um, some criteria, but actually would be good candidates or, or potential um, as kind of extended criteria and donors. Um, there's some that have quite a lot of literature looking at kidney biopsies and segmentations that way. So that might help um, for, to more quickly screen through biopsies and recognize any abnormalities that way. Um, I'm not sure about how many, there are quite a number of prediction models, but a lot of these prediction models on, you know, who would be a good donor, who would, you know, needs higher, who would have early or delayed graft function. But the problem with that and most ML algorithms so far is that they're kind of internally done um, without external validation. And I would not trust anything um, until there is vigorous multi-center external validation, which unfortunately is still very difficult, mainly because people, sharing of data is very difficult. I hope that helped answer some of your parts of that question. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Well, if there's no further questions, I guess we'll uh, say goodbye, but thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Chan, for coming and speaking to us. We really appreciate that. Um, I hope everyone has a good weekend and hope to see you next month. Thank you right. so much. Thank you so much.